Further, Ananda, the monk, not attending to the perception of the dimension of nothingness, not attending to the perception of the dimension of neither perception nor non-perception, attends to the singleness based on the themeless concentration of awareness. His mind takes pleasure, finds satisfaction, settles and indulges in its themeless concentration of awareness. He discerns that this themeless concentration of awareness is fabricated and mentally fashioned. And he discerns that whatever is fabricated and mentally fashioned is inconstant and subject to cessation. Thus knowing, thus seeing, his heart is released from the effluent of sensuality, the effluent of becoming, the affluent of ignorance. With release, there is the knowledge released. He discerns that birth is ended, the holy life fulfilled, the task done. There is nothing further for this world. Namaste. So this is enlightenment. Complete, pure, and final. This is the thing toward which we have been striving and progressing for many, many lifetimes. And this is how the Buddha attained it himself. So immediately after this, then he spoke the verse, huh? etam santam etam panitam yadidam sabba sankara samato. You see, but it's not like he was sitting there trying to stop the sankara. Rather, he was concentrating on these progressively more and more subtle layers of emptiness. So some people wrongly accuse the Buddha of being a, a, a shunyavadi, as it's called. Uh, shunyavadi means that emptiness is the truth. But if emptiness was the truth, he wouldn't say that these states of concentration are fabricated and mentally fashioned. Because the truth is not fabricated. The truth is not fabric, uh, mentally fashioned. The truth is the truth and it's always the truth. The question is, how do you realize the truth? Because to fight with the mind only makes it stronger. As we pointed out last time, if you sit there trying to stop sankara or trying to stop desire or trying to stop egotism, you're only going to make it worse. The mind thrives on attention. So how do you defeat the mind? Put your attention on something else, something beautiful, because it has to attract your interest. You have to be sincerely interested and attracted to the object of meditation. So this sequence of meditations begins from the awareness of earth as a state of matter, as an element. And then it proceeds through awareness of space, awareness of nothingness, awareness of neither perception nor non-perception. And finally, themeless concentration. Huh? Just indulging in the pleasure of the concentrated mind. It's a beautiful state. And what do you get from that state? The realization that all pleasure is available within. You don't have to go out through the senses.
Huh? We talked about this quite a bit in the Secret of the Golden Flower series. That if you have ecstasy available to you at any time, it changes your relationship with pleasure. You don't have to get your fix <laughs> by going out through the senses. You can simply reside in a house of ecstasy, in a house of emptiness. See, and what does emptiness mean to the Buddha? Not exactly nothingness, but rather the absence of the things that we normally give our attention to. The mind, the ego, thoughts, our identity, desire, activities, possessions, and so on. See, all those positive things do nothing but strengthen the mind. So the Buddha takes the negative path. Don't think about that stuff. Think about this progression of more and more subtle concentrations until you finally reach the themeless concentration itself. And then what? <laughs> you realize that all these concentrations are simply mental fabrications. And as we uh, have sung, <laughs> all fabrications are subject to cessation. So because of this, they cannot be the ultimate, even though they may be very long lasting, very robust, anti-fragile. Still, they are not the supreme truth. So that's why the Buddha says here, the heart is released from the effluence. Effluent means a kind of pollution, isn't it? So the effluent of sensuality, of becoming, of ignorance. See, because of ignorance, we think we can counteract the suffering of life by becoming something other than what we already are. But the process of becoming itself creates karma, which results in further suffering. Isn't it? Even the religionist's idea of, let's say, going to heaven means one has to take birth in heaven. And taking birth is a painstaking affair. If you've ever been present at a birth, you know there's suffering involved for everyone concerned. And that which is born must also die. So if there's birth in heaven, there's also death in heaven. And the Vedic scriptures talk about this. That after one's good karma has been uh, used up in heavenly enjoyment, one falls down again to the earthly planet and has to take birth in a human womb. So this is all suffering. How do we end suffering? We end becoming. How do we end becoming? We end desire, sensuality. How do we end desire? We end ignorance. How do we end ignorance? By hearing from the wise. So one should read and hear these suttas, not from just anyone, but from someone who has realized them from someone who has gone through this uh, more and more subtle layers of mental fabrication until he has come out the other side of the process pure and cleansed. What does that mean, pure? It means that he is no longer relying on mental fabrication for his pleasure, identity, 
and even for knowledge. That rather, he has discovered the key to getting rid of these things. Huh? That's why the Buddha never took a position in any of the philosophical debates of his time. He would say, no, that any position, pro or con, is an extreme. And the Tathagata, the well-gone one, follows the middle path. What is the middle path? Paticca Samuppada, dependent arising. We've already done a whole series on that. So, if you follow the middle path, then you will come to this knowledge by suffering again and again. Finally, you will take shelter of the wise. And the wise will guide you in the process, the Eightfold Path or the equivalent thereof. And then what? He discerns that whatever disturbances would exist based on the effluent of sensuality, the effluent of becoming, the effluent of ignorance are not present. There is only this modicum of disturbance, that connected with the six sensory spheres, dependent on this very body, with life as its condition. He discerns that this mode of perception is empty of the effluent of sensuality, becoming, and ignorance. And there is just this non-emptiness, that connected with the six sensory spheres, dependent on this very body, with life as its condition. Thus, he regards it as empty of whatever is not there. Whatever remains, he discerns as present. There is this. And so this, his entry into emptiness, accords with actuality, is undistorted in meaning, pure, superior, and unsurpassed. So this is new. Pure, superior and unsurpassed. In the other stages, he didn't say that. What did he say? He said, it's undistorted in meaning and pure. But now he says, it's undistorted in meaning, pure, superior and unsurpassed. What does that mean? that this is the ultimate enlightenment. This is as good as it gets. Huh? See, people mythologize the Buddha. They try to make him into some kind of God. The Mahayanists take it to an extreme. They say that the Buddha is basically the Brahman, which in one sense is true. But at the same time, he was an ordinary human being who attained this complete realization of his actual nature. And so he finishes the sutta like this. Ananda, whatever contemplatives and Brahmins who in the past entered and remained in an emptiness that was pure, superior, and unsurpassed, they all entered and remained in this very same emptiness that is pure, superior, and unsurpassed. Whatever contemplatives and Brahmins who in the future will enter and remain in an emptiness that will be pure, superior, and unsurpassed, they will all enter and remain in this very same emptiness that is pure, superior, and unsurpassed. Whatever contemplatives and Brahmins who at present enter and remain in an emptiness that is pure, superior, and unsurpassed. They all enter and remain in this very same emptiness that is pure, superior, and unsurpassed. Therefore, Ananda, you should train yourselves. We will enter and remain in the emptiness that is pure, superior, and unsurpassed. That is what the Blessed One said. Gratified. Venerable Ananda delighted in the Blessed One's words. 
and so should we. In other words, emptiness is emptiness. <laughs> it may seem tautological, but it's true. There's no way to distinguish one emptiness from another emptiness. And since all of us are at the core, nothing but emptiness, that's what awareness is. Huh? It's an emptiness that simply shows up whatever is put into it. So all of us are emptiness. All of us are the same. All of us are one. There's no difference between our core essence and Brahman. That is the meaning of the Buddha's teaching. That is also the meaning of the Vedic teaching. Tatramasi, thou art that. Aham Brahmasmi, I am Brahman. So that is why we designed this logo, combining the Dhamma wheel and the Om symbol. Because both of these teachings are talking about the same thing, only using different language. And we think the Buddha's teaching is more detailed and therefore more accurate and easier to explain in the higher re reaches of meditation, the topmost uh, end of the path. And so in the next series, we'll be going into the Four Noble Truths and how the Buddha's teaching was derived from them. Aung Tatsa. Buddha Saranai. <laughs>